Welcome to tonight's webinar. I'm Rose Tobian, founder of the Speaker Series, which is hosting tonight's event. On behalf of the Field Museum, Filipino American Historical Society of Chicago, Northern Illinois University Center for Southeast Asian Studies, and the Sampagita Group, we're pleased to present Habi, Weaving the Language Patterns of Filipino Bayanihan. Tonight's speakers include Jamie Kelly, Head of Anthropology Collections at the Field Museum, John Paul De La Rosa, a Fulbright Foreign Language Teaching Assistant at Northern Illinois University, and Rodalyn gallo Crail, instructor at Northern Illinois University. You'll also hear from our other team members, Lonnie Chan and Ruben Salazar, at the end. Please feel free to submit comments and questions in your sidebar. Our speakers will try and answer as many of your questions at the end of the presentation. We hope that you enjoy tonight's virtual learning opportunity. Now let's begin our presentation, Philippine Languages with Collections Highlights from the Field Museum, with Jamie Kelly. Thank you, Rose. And thanks to all of you for attending this evening's event. It's a pleasure to be a part of this presentation, exploring the topic of Bayanian. And it's a great opportunity for us to share with you some of the collections from the Philippines that are at the Field Museum. We wouldn't be here talking with you if it weren't for the spirit of community. I want to thank Rose Tobayan, Lonnie Chan, and Ruben Salazar for being living examples of this spirit over the years in their community and in partnering with the Field Museum and specifically for working with John Paul and Rodolin to put this all together. They are several of a number of community members who have partnered with the museum over the years. Rose was especially instrumental in putting the logistics together for this this evening. Before we jump into this evening's topic with our two main speakers, I want to give you a little context for some of the Field Museum collections they'll be sharing in their talk, as well as how the spirit of community has breathed new life into these collections. Following their talk, I'll share some highlights of a few additional collection items. The Field Museum is home to 10,000 cultural artifacts from the Philippines. This is not to mention the numerous natural history specimens the museum also cares for and studies. Artifacts include personal adornments, weapons, musical instruments, basketry, wood carvings, and items related to food and feasting. And of course, fabulous examples of weaving and textiles. These are just a few highlights. The U.S. occupation of the Philippines started in 1898, and the Philippine Reservation at the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair attracted the attention of a Gilded Age industrialist who was a grain merchant by the name of Robert Fowler Cummings. In 1906, he approached the museum with a proposition of funding $20,000 to cover the expenses of ethnographic fieldwork and collections. In return, the museum guaranteed to bear the cost of setting up a large permanent Philippine exhibition. Starting in 1906, fieldwork in the Philippines was undertaken by anthropologists. Pay Cooper Cole, Mabel Cook Cole, Stephen Sims, William Jones, and Laura Watson Benedict. With the exception of Laura Watson Benedict, the research and collections of these anthropologists ended up at the Field Museum. Roughly 75% of the 10,000 artifacts in the Philippine collections came through these anthropologists. Their research resulted in a number of seminal publications, as well as a long-term exhibit devoted to the Philippine Islands that opened in 1928 and was on view until 1985. It was during the 1980s that many of the exhibits, such as the Philippine exhibits that were on the ground floor, were removed so that modern amenities such as air conditioning could be added to the museum. In 1998, with community support, the Phil Field Museum created two special exhibits to celebrate the Philippine centennial, Voyage of a Nation, the Philippines, and Vanishing Treasures of the Philippine Rainforest. However, following the centennial in 1998, the collections from the Philippines continued to sit out of sight in storage, rarely accessed and used. It prompted John Terrell, the curator who took over stewardship for these collections about 11 years ago, to ask, why do we have these if they're not being used? And who's even aware that we have these collections? So it was in 2011, through attending large community events, that we began to ask the Philippine X American community in the Chicago area that question. Were they even aware of this collection? Most were not aware of the collection and its history. Those who were interested in working with us began to meet regularly so that they could get to know one another and we could get to know them. And we began to discuss ways in which the collections could be made more accessible and used. The Few Museum, as some of you may know, is home to a Maori meeting house that we co-curate with the source community of Tokomoro Bay in New Zealand. Part of the care for this house is their request that it be used as a gathering place for communities. 
In 2013, we held a porphyry to formally welcome the Philippine X community as part of the Field Museum to co-curate their heritage. We entered into co-curation with the tenants first. We realized that we at the museum are not the experts or sole authority. And second, it's not a project. It's a long-term partnership that we hope will grow and evolve. So we began small with three to four community events for the first year or two that were organized by the community. We provided a venue and access to collections to select items to bring out for events. These events were called Quintuhan, which is storytelling, essentially in Tagalog, and community members began to share information about what they knew about these collection items. This information those then was added to the museum's collections database. Slowly, we began to expand the scope of what we could do. One summer, we began and provided a paid internship for a doctoral student from the Philippines to create a story map website to share a few highlights from the collections to build broader interest. By 2013, we worked with the community to write a grant to an anonymous foundation and began to further digitize the collections and create an online curation portal for the collections where community members and researchers can contribute to what they know about the collections. We were awarded a two-year grant. Community members served as advisors in hiring a community collection specialist, Cassie Pontone, to implement the project. Cassie and the community were quite successful. She had a great team of community volunteers and paid interns. They digitized 80% of the collection and launched the curation portal for the Philippines. During this two-year project, community involvement and activity increased dramatically. One of our community partners, Trisha Martin, who is a professional artist and educator, conceived and began to organize a series of monthly events called Pananam Pinoy, which roughly translates into Philippine heritage or inheritance. Guest organizers, a number of whom are practitioners, explore different themes from food to weapons, to tattooing, to textiles, to identity. Organizers would select 10 to 20 items from the collections to illustrate the theme of the session. There were creative activities such as creating artworks, crafts, or performing dance. And of course, a very important aspect of Philippine X culture, sharing of food was another important component of these events. In addition to these events, our postdoctoral fellow, Neil Mathern at the time and colleagues wrote about co-curation and the Philippine X community. He also was awarded an NEH Common Heritage Grant for communities to record their oral histories. In addition to this, we also undertook several small exhibits that are co-curated by the community. We've also had an uptick in visits to the collections by community and student groups, as well as researchers from across the world. This included a visit this past July by a council of indigenous elders and leaders from Mindanao. Webinars like this one are another example of us working together with the Philam and broader Philippine community. With that background on collections and community spirit, I have the honor to introduce John Paul De La Rosa, who is a Fulbright foreign language teaching assistant at Northern Illinois University. Earlier this year, he approached the museum about doing this presentation. So I reached out to our community partners to get their thoughts and see what we could do. And here we are. I'm delighted to turn this over to John Paul. Thank you very much, Jamie. My presentation is all about revisiting the eight major Philippine languages. Tonight, we will all be revisiting the linguistic landscape of the Philippines through this presentation titled Sinusong Wika, Revisiting Major Philippine Languages. Sinusong Wika means mother language or mother tongue in English. My objectives for this presentation are the following. Number one, revisit the eight major Philippine languages. Number two, discuss some relevant efforts on the revitalization of Philippine languages. And number three, spread the message of positivity and a sense of community through a video presentation featuring different Philippine languages. Let's look at the linguistic landscape of the Philippines in brief. Aside from the 7,641 islands of the country, it is also blessed with over 180 living languages. Although it is known to many that the two official languages of the Philippines are Filipino and English, it is common to meet Filipinos who can speak at least three languages. In my case, my mother tongue is Kapampangan, but I can understand and speak Tagalog, Hiligaynon, and English. 
This makes the Philippines more linguistically diverse than at least 190 countries in the world. Alongside the existence of different languages in the Philippines are over 110 ethno-linguistic groups, making the country culturally rich as well. The major regional languages are Aklanon, Basian, Bicol, Cebuano, Chabacano, a Spanish-based Creole, Hiligaynon, Ibanag, Ilocano, Ilongo, Ivatan, Maranao, Tagalog, Kapampangan, Kinaraya, Waray, Maguindanao, Pangasinan, Sambal, Surigao, Non, Tausug, and Yakan. Some of these languages have been rigor rigorously studied, while others need further documentation. There are actually eight major languages in the Philippines. These are Tagalog, Bicol, Ilocano or Iloco, Pangasinan, Kapampangan, Hiligaynon, Waray, and Cebuano. What binds them together is that they are all categorized under Malayo-Polynesian language family subgroup of the Austronesian language family. This language subgroup also includes Bahasa Melayu in Malaysia, Bahasa Indonesia, Javanese and Sundanese languages in the Indonesian archipelago. Philippine languages also have traces of foreign languages such as Spanish and English respectively. This time, we will have our mini lesson on the eight major Philippine languages. I will be teaching you two important greetings translated in these mother tongues. We have good evening and thank you very much. Let us see what's common among these languages as we say these two phrases. Just a disclaimer, however, I am not an expert speaker or a fluent speaker of majority of these languages, but I asked help from relatives and friends to translate these phrases. So I think we will be good and we will learn as one. You can participate by repeating the phrases after I say them. So are we ready? I think we're ready. We shall start with Tagalog, the most spoken language in the Philippines. This language is spoken in the Luzon Island, including the island of Palawan in western Philippines. Bicol, on the other hand, is spoken in the Bicol Peninsula, including Catanduanes, Boreas Island, and Masbate. Now, let us greet one another in Tagalog and Bicol. In Tagalog, we say magandang gabi. In Bicol, we say marhay na banggi, for good evening. And then we say maraming salamat, salamat na marahay in Bicol for thank you very much. We now proceed to the other languages spoken in the Luzon Island. First is Ilocano or Iloco. It is considered as the third most spoken Philippine language in the, Cordill in the Cordilleras, Ilocos region, including La Union and other parts of Tarlac. Pangasinan, on the other hand, is spoken in southwestern La Union and the province of Pangasinan. How do we say good evening and thank you very much in Ilocano and Pangasinan? So, let's try. In Ilocano or Iloco, we say naimbag arabii. In Pangasinan, it's masantosa yalabi. Agyamanak is thank you very much in Ilocano, while in Pangasinan, it's balbaleg ya salamat. Now, Kapampangan is close to my heart because it is my mother tongue or home language. The language is spoken in central Luzon, such as in the provinces of Pampanga, Tarlac, Zambales, Bataan, Nueva Ecija, and Bulacan. In Kapampangan, how do we say good evening and thank you very much? You may repeat after me. So, we say good evening as Maya Pabengi and thank you very much, Dakala Salamat. In the Visayan region, we have the Hiligaynon or Ilongo and the Waray languages. Hiligaynon is spoken in the island of Panay in the Visayas such as in the provinces of Iloilo, Aklan, Capiz, including the province of Negros Occidental. In the Sox region, region in Mindanao, Hiligaynon is also spoken. Waray is native to eastern Visayas, some parts of Masbate and Sorsogon. So let's have our speaking practice for Hiligaynon and Waray. How do we say good evening in Hiligaynon or Ilonggo? Maayong gabi. In Waray, maupay nga gabi. Thank you very much in Hiligaynon or Ilonggo is damo nga salamat. It's also the same in Waray. They also say damo nga salamat. Finally, we have the Cebuano language. 
It is the second most spoken language in the Philippines after Tagalog. It is spoken in the provinces of Cebu, Negros Oriental, Bohol, and other parts of Mindanao. Now, let us end this speaking lesson the Cebuano way. So in Cebuano, we say good evening as maayong gabi. And this one is very popular. Like when you say thank you very much in Cebuano, you say daghang salamat. I also want to highlight two of the relevant efforts in the revitalization of these Philippine languages. First is the implementation of MTBMLE or Mother Tongue Based Multilingual Education in basic education in the country. This forms part of Republic Act No. 10533, otherwise known as the Enhanced Basic Education Act of 2013 in the Philippines. This changed the course of education in the country. It covers kindergarten and 12 years of basic education with the addition of grades 11 and 12. MTBMLE is first language first, wherein students from kindergarten to grade 3 learn their mother tongues first until they transition to Filipino and later on to English. So why is this so? This was through the groundbreaking research conducted by Decker and Young of the Summer Institute of Linguistics in 2007. Based on the results, students would learn concepts in school better when they are taught first in their mother tongues. The experiment featured mother tongue instruction in Lubuagan in Kalinga in Northern Philippines. Children were taught to read in the local language first, and teachers taught key subjects such as mathematics in the local language as well. The researchers saw positive results in terms of educational outcomes after children were exposed to instruction using the local language. The MTBMLE is indeed a way to empower mother tongues in the Philippines. An effort to revitalize the many languages in the Philippines, particularly the dying ones, is through language planning and documentation. This has been done by many linguists and language scholars in the Philippines. The status of Manila Bay Chabacano as a language is an example of this language planning and documentation efforts. Another example are the many language documentation projects from De La Salle University or DLSU through the headship of Dr. Shirley Dita, a known Filipino applied linguist. She, her team, her team, and DLSU doctoral students have been conducting studies to document different Philippine languages. The one that we have here is an attempt to digitize corpora of Philippine languages. As such, these efforts are helpful ways to prevent the death or extinction of any Philippine language, especially indigenous ones. Once any language is forgotten or not spoken anymore, the ethnicization may occur, where people start to depatronize their culture and sadly, they will undo traditional practices. The next speaker is Professor Rodeline Gallo Crail from Northern Illinois University. Magandang gabi po sa inyong lahat. My name is Rodeline Gallo Crail. My section in this webinar is to talk to you about the language of community. I have set four goals in this presentation on the language of community. I'd like to give you an overview of my Philippine-related work at Northern Illinois University, give you a brief intro to the Philippine language, present important linguistic features of the language, and then give you a good sample of social and reciprocal affixes. So what do I do on campus and online at NIU? Or I teach all the levels of Tagalog from beginning to advance. And I also teach translation and also Southeast Asian, Southeast Asian literatures. I also maintain and develop the instructional resources online for the language and for other resources related to, um, to the Philippines. This is part of the bigger Southeast Asian country online resources called Seasite. The Tagalog website is visited by over 5 million visitors every year. This is part of what I do on campus. So when I'm teaching the language in the classroom, community is one concept that I promote. 
I teach using small group context and students work in small groups. They are trained to tutor, to mentor one another because Filipinas value community. I then do my best to simulate community, a community in the classroom. I do not teach the way most foreign languages are taught in the American classroom. Students are encouraged to collaborate, to work in pairs, in small groups, and support each other in the learning, in the learning process. The community, the concept of community is also part of many of our Philippine-related programs on campus, including the Philippine Youth Leadership program or PYLP. This is a youth exchange program funded by the U.S. Department and Department of State Bureau of um, Educational and Cultural Affairs. The program brings 28 youth leaders ages 15, 16, and 17 from Mindanao for youth leadership and youth development month-long training in the U.S. They participate in a variety of workshops and upper training opportunities related to peace building, volunteerism, social advocacy, environmental preservation, and many other topics. One of the themes that we incorporated in the past year is asset-based community development, or ABCD, where we trained the youth leaders in identifying assets in their communities so that when they go back to their respective barrios, towns, cities, and villages, and implement their micro projects. They then learn to engage with the different community assets. They listen to community members and then explore better ways of telling stories of their, of their communities. Now let's go back to language. For those of you who are not familiar with Tagalog, the language has a strong affinity with Indo-Malaysian languages. It has also incorporated significant number of Spanish words and, and expression. I always tell my students that Tagalog is not a wide language. Instead, it is a deep language. And what does that mean? It means that we do not have a lot of words. The way to expand is use the words we already have to create more words. How do we do that? We add affixes to the roots of words. We add letters, combination of letters, prefixes at the beginning of the words, infixes inside the words, and then suffixes at the end of the roots of words to create more words. So these are some of the features of the language. It is non-syntax, which means that words are placed in any position. Because Tagalog is a marked language, positions of words in a sentence do not always follow the subject, verb, object, order in, in English. The language also presents the concept of focus to mark the topic of the topic in a given sentence. It uses linkers to indicate relationships of two given, given words. It also uses the concept of aspect to indicate the tense or tense and time. So one important feature of the language is the use of markers and affixes we have to mark or label our words. Verbs are marked to indicate tense, aspect, and also focus. Adjectives are marked to indicate their relationships with the nouns. Nouns are marked to indicate their focus. Are they the actor? Are they the instrument? Are they the object? Are they the location? So this tapestry of all these labels or all these markers and all these affixes provides different meanings on how to use the words in the sentence, in, in, a, in a sentence. So in the next few slides, I would like to give some examples of these affixes. A good example is the word bayanihan. You have the word bayan, which means country, and then bayani means hero, and then you have the affix han um, at the end of the word to indicate whether this is an event, an act, or also a place. Bayanihan means heroic act. It can also mean heroic place or event. And so in the minds of Filipinos, it could mean those who join in this act, in this place, in this event, are heroes to each other. So what are these affixes that grammarians refer to as social or reciprocal affixes. There are a number of these, but for tonight, I would like to give you a few examples. So one example is the affix ka plus 
a noun root or sometimes it can also mean a uh, you can also use a verbal root a good way to understand this is to ask the question what is the relationship here are some examples capamilia just move this so you can see capamilia family member katabi person next to me or to someone kabahay housemate kalaro playmate kaaway enemy kapareha partner kaklase classmate kabayan townmate kapatid sibling kasama companion the next another example is the use of mug plus noun the way to understand this is to ask the question what is their relationship so what is their relationship so the good example here is um, Magtatay, it means father and son or daughter. Magnanay, mother and son or daughter. Maglola, grandma and, and granddaughter and grandson. Or it can all, you can also say maglolo, grandpa and granddaughter and grandson. Magtita, magtito, aunt, uncle and, and niece and nephew. Now there are... Um, and then there are these verbal affixes, um, and one example is the use of mug, and then you have the verb root, and then the un at the end. All these entities in a word are all connected to each other. Similar to that concept of banig, where every strand is woven into each other. You put all these affixes together with a word root, allows you to create a new word with a new meaning so for example you have the word love which is in the middle of this word then you have the prefix mug and then the an at the end so love each other would you would say mag mahalan eat together you would say mag kainan help each other mag tulungan kiss each other mag halikan irritate each other mag tampuhan give each other mag bigayan shake each other's hand would be mug kamayan of course because these are verbs you will need to conjugate the words to indicate time another example is the use maki plus verb or noun root so what you do is you actually just prefix it before the before the root so maki dalamhati is to join in grief maki inom to join for a drink Makikain, to join in eating. Makisakai, to join in riding a vehicle. Makikanta, to join in singing. Again, when you use these sentences, you have to have two actors because it can't be one. It requires a plural, plural actor. So when you use it in a sentence, because these are verbs, you need to conjugate it in the past, present, or future. A good example is Ben joined Tony in a vehicle. Nakisakai si Ben kay Tony. We will join our grandparents for a meal later. Makikika in kami kina Lola at Lolo mamaya. So if you have, if you're interested in in more um, information about the language, you can visit the website at www.seaside.nau.edu backslash Tagalog. Or if you want more information about PYLP, you can also go to our website at www.pylp2019.org. Now you will hear back from Jamie Kelly to see more of the Philippine collection from the Field Museum. Thank you, Rodalyn, and thank you, John Paul. Concluding this evening's talk, I want to share a few additional highlights from the collection. Many of these relate to weaving and mats. As I mentioned, one of the reasons we began to co-curate the Philippine collections is that we at the museum realize we're not the only experts. As I scroll through these slides, I won't speak much, as I'm not an expert on these, merely a caretaker. As you'll see, there's some basic information on these items. But feel free to share stories and information as they may relate to these items at the conclusion of this presentation. At the end, we'll also take questions for the presenters. Here, we, as you can see, we have a model of an Ifugao uh, Nipa hut. This is a model that was put together um, about 30 or 40 years ago and is in the collections here at the museum. And here we'll have a uh, 
selection of different mats from throughout the Philippines. This particular one is, as you can see, from uh, Luzon, uh, made of pandan pandanus fiber. And we have from Palawan, this sleeping mat. And then finally, this one is a more recent acquisition that came from Mindanao that um, came here only a few years ago. And then moving on from mats, we move on to textiles. There is certainly a revitalization underway to try to revitalize um, weaving in places like Luzon, uh, especially backstrap weaving. Uh, this is a backstrap loom with a partially completed belt on it that came to the collections uh, through the anthropologists in the early 20th century. Here we have a pillow cover that comes from the Bukidnon in Mindanao. This was made in the 1970s on a backstrap loom uh, and comes from the mountain province in Luzon. This comes from the Sulu province and it's a scrap of fabric that would have been probably used in a woman's skirt. Uh, this little Second last one here, I'm going to show you just a close-up of that fabric just to show the detail of the warps and the wefts and all that goes into weaving these. It's pretty incredible. And then finally, I'll end with this women's jacket from Mindanao, very heavily embroidered and sequined, very beautiful, as well as some of the hand-cut and hand-drilled sequins that are part of this. Trying out in a, in a webinar platform and uh, we appreciate your patience and uh, love the lively chats that we've had going on here. Um, before uh, we start to field questions uh, this evening, um, I want to begin by noting that um, even though we're virtual this evening, um, the Field Museum does occupy a physical space in the Chicagoland area, and the Field Museum and myself acknowledge that it and I reside on the traditional homelands of the Winnebago Ho-Chunk, the Oto, the Missouri, the Iowas, the Menominee, the Meskwaki, the Sauk, the Miami, the Way, the Pianakasra, the Kickapoo, the Illini Confederacy, the Ojibwe, the Adawa, and the Badawatomi. The museum recognizes, and it's grateful, as do I, for the original peoples who laid the foundation for the city of Chicago and the diverse indigenous nations that reside in Chicago today. And so with that, I'd like to uh, open it up, and we'd like to open up for questions for Rodalyn and John Paul and myself. So feel free to put comments in the chat here. Um, and we can and we can get started. Um, there's one here that we could start with um, with a question that maybe one of you could answer. It says, why do you think Tagalog is not a wide language? Could it be because the growth was stymied because of colon colonization? A lot of Tagalog words are no longer in use because Spanish and English words have replaced them. As as I mentioned earlier, you know the Tagalog. Um, oh, okay, it is on now. Yeah, as as I mentioned, um, as I mentioned earlier, Tagalog is. Um, can we? Am I on? Okay. okay. Sorry, I had my volume down. That's why I couldn't hear you. Can you? Am yeah, I, I can hear you. No, I, you're, okay. you're fine. Sorry, it was my, my end. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you again for, for your patience. We are trying out. This is our first time to actually try out this um, webinar program. Um, and so the question is, why is it not, why is it a, not a wide language? And um, and, and the answer to that is, you know, it, it really does follow the same uh, characteristics of any of the Indo-Malaysian languages. You know, um, it, you have the root and then you, you add all these affixes, combination of letters to create additional words. Um, 
is it because it was stymied by by colonization? I would say um, it actually the colonization added more words to you know to to the language. Uh, it expanded more words. Um, I would I would maybe that question could probably come from you know most Filipino speakers um, are are combining um, English words or or um, or Spanish words with um, with the affixes that um, that we have we have in Tagalog and and I think part of that is all part of the evolution of, of the language the development of the language it is expanding um, in in such a way that is being influenced by by uh, culture, you know, by uh, the influence of, of other cultures. Um, and I think that probably would um, make the language um, different from, from the other, um, you know, other Southeast Asian languages, because again, of the influence of, of colonization, but there is that deeper part of the language that, that will never, never change. You know, we would still have affixes. We would still have to expand the word, uh, a certain word using all the rules of grammar. Um, that part of it has not changed and nothing will change that. We will add more roots, but the affixes will always be be there. It would never, it will never be diminished. And I hope that answers your question. Um, uh, Janpal, do you wanna add something? Is there something that you would like to add to that question? Uh, just like what you've said, Ate. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, maybe because Tagalog... Uh, wait, wait, I'm, I'm at a loss for words, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the... So the question, what's the question or, again, Ate? Or maybe, um, maybe there's also the debate between, you know, is it Tagalog, is it Filipino? So that mm -hmm. in terms of, of language planning and language palace policy, that's also been um, the maybe the contributing part factor on uh, some of the questions that you have here. You know, why is it that second generation Filipinos um, in in just like a question here. The second generation Filipinos um, are not preserving the language. Um, you know, part of that, especially if you're Filipino American, part of that is um, the the use of language at home. Um, it's most Filipino Americans are are choosing to be immersed in in their community in the community. Mm -hmm. And so part of that uh, loss is, or not being able to maintain, is um, the choices that families in the United States um, are yeah. using. Um, I agree, Paul. Like, like children would want to assimilate. Mm -hmm. That's why they, they would prefer uh, to speak and use English. For example, they are here in the United States, than Tagalog or Filipino or any mm -hmm. other Philippine languages that their parents speak and uh, mm -hmm. maybe that affects why Filipino or Tagalog is not so popular in, in the in the US and maybe uh, in terms of uh, like exposure I think there are only few universities mm -hmm. in the United States that offer Tagalog programs that's why when I when I was chosen mm -hmm. as a Fulbright foreign language teaching assistant I tried sending emails to different U.S. universities asking them if they want to offer Tagalog mm -hmm. or, or Filipino in their in their foreign language programs. Unfortunately, like in, in our case, we are only three FLTAs this year, one FLTA at Cornell University in New York, and then me at NIU, and then the other one in the Bay Area. So, so if only we could uh, ask other universities to to offer Tagalog or Filipino, that would help. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is a statement here and also a question. Uh, there is a significant colonial influence in the Philippines before and even today. The Filipino language continues to evolve with foreign, foreign influence, 
For example, Filipinos are more accustomed to talk in Taglish, more, more so than Filipino. What advice do you have to preserve the language and what advice do you have for films in the U.S.? Um, it's that question is is very complex in the Philippines because it's a multilingual country. You know, you have indigenous languages. Um, there are other languages in different parts of the Philippines, and so the, as a country, um, they have to make a choice. You know, language choice. Um, they're they're trying to experiment. You know, different things. You know, using ethnic or local language to teach. I think John Paul talked a little bit about that earlier. You know, to teach, uh, to using the school, um, and so. In terms, in terms of language planning and curriculum development, you know that can pose a lot of problems. Um, and so, part of that is is to um, to continue um, to continue trying out different things, but also it has to be a choice that, as a country, they have to make in terms of you know um, using the national language. You know, they try to they try to change the name actually to Filipino. Um, and, and create a name for a national language, um, and so that to in, to integrate um, the different major languages in in the Philippines. So, what advice do I have for films in the U.S.? Um, again, you know, it has to be a choice that communities uh, have to do. Uh, if you'd like the second, the next generation of Filipino Americans to to speak. Filipino. It has to begin at home. Uh, it is okay for Filipino American kids, uh, especially if both parents are Filipinos. It's okay to speak, to be a bilingual. In fact, there are benefits to, to bilingualism. Um, again, um, Filipino Americans have made a choice to to assimilate uh, for the for the next generation to be integrated well in in the community in the schools, uh, but I think we're really being left behind by the other um, communities where some of their most of their kids still speak Cambodian or Laotian or, or Vietnamese, uh, but. You know, there are schools like the Northern Illinois University who actually teach Filipinos. So that's really a benefit. So if you come to NAU, that's, uh, then your kids could learn the Filipino language. And, and it's always, for me, uh, it, it becomes a public service that I do this for the Filipino American kids who are on campus. Um, and then, of course, you have the other, um, other groups on campus that are also taking these classes. Um, There's one I can quickly answer while you're looking, um, Rodolin and JP. There's mm -hmm. a question about the strength of our collections at the museum from the Visayas. And it's not, uh, we have some, but it's not an area that we have um, a lot from. Mm -hmm. um, much of the collections, in a sense, about 75% of it came through early anthropologists, um, came from their field work, which is mostly focused in Luzon and in Mindanao and a little bit in Palawan. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's where the strings are. And um, yeah, the textiles are also uh, a very strong component, as I think I might have mentioned. Um, and there's a question of when the last time the Field Museum had shown some of its textiles to the public. Um, nothing extensive. Probably the last time was that 1998 centennial exhibit. But we have done um, shown some textiles, um, like one here, one there, and the co-curated exhibits that um, we've had up in the past few years at the museum. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's certainly something we would like to do more of um, because it's a really um, vibrant part of the, the collection. And then there was another question about the colors used um, in some of the textiles from Luzon by one of the groups. I'm looking for that question here really quickly. Um, and not seeing it. Oh, Ifugao. Oh, yeah, why are certain colors mm -hmm. and shades such as red, black, green, white more common in Ifugao? Um, Prints than others. I'm, I'm afraid I'm not in, uh, knowledgeable in that area, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not able to answer that. But thank you for the question. There may be others in the chat who may be more knowledgeable that could answer that mm -hmm. question. Um, but I'll um, turn back over to you guys for, for additional questions that you may have seen. Yeah, there are questions on, and maybe it's a bigger, uh, bigger discussion in the future that we could explore on language shift. Uh, bilingualism, language choice, you know, all of those are 
or complex topic to, to, to really talk about in more in depth uh, in this in this presentation. You know, I, but I, I think when I talk about language choice, um, there is the there is the biggest bigger choice that as a country you do uh, you make, and then for Filipino Americans, um, you know the 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 home, you know, uh, we make that choice. Um, and if two parents, you know, are both Filipinos, um, and I think that's how, you know, I would say that my observation and also studies show that, that um, Filipinos or, or other, other language groups who were able to preserve um, their language at home um, make that choice. And, um, in, in my observation, and there are a lot of a number of studies that also point to that, is the Filipino American homes are are oftentimes not making that choice um, for their children, and and that's why. But again, you know, these are these are um, these are discussions that we could probably do uh, in the future as part of our series that that we we do again in in the future. Um, let's see here. Some questions. There's, as you're looking, there was a question about whether we'd make this available um, mm -hmm. as a recording for for later use and for people to use. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a new webinar platform that we're still exploring. Um, that mm -hmm. the speaker series is still exploring. So we're, we're we're figuring things out and figuring out if that's mm -hmm. possible. So we can't answer that question right yet. But um, but if we do, we'll be sure to let folks know. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are a number of questions related to language, and I would say um, visit the website because it will have um, an in-depth discussion on tense, on aspect, um, and other gr grammar questions. And you could do that. Let me see here. Are there some other questions? Um, there was a question about community reports. I did mention the one. Um, the one link, biodiversity.org has field museum publications by the anthropologists, but um, some of the the um, reporting that was done or, or articles that were done by Dr. Neil Mathern, who was a postdoc at the field museum um, for a few years, um, and he's with us this evening. Um, you could look up some of his academic articles, articles that I think he co-wrote co -wrote with some, some of our, our um, folks that we worked with. Um, mm -hmm. So you could look look for those. I don't have those handy at the moment, but uh, but he might if he does, he might mm -hmm. be able to post them in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, um, and if, is, oh, oh no, sorry. Go okay. ahead. Yeah, John Paul, would you like to say something about the Galug and Filipino question? Uh, that you know, I I could I could do it too. But again, you know, the differentiation. In is also available on our website. But maybe John Paul, you could probably uh, say answer that question. What is the difference between Filipino and Tagalog? And I should note that um, John, John Paul is, um, he's got a, a having issues with, with his Wi-Fi right now. So he's Hello. doing the best. <laughs> we hear you, John Paul. <laughs> yeah. So that's why okay. you can't always see his, his video. But just, just an addition to what Professor Quayle had mentioned, because I, I only learned some of the the uh, aspects of different aspects of learning Tagalog from from Professor Creel her, herself, and what I learned about Tagalog is for you to be able to speak. I, I'm speaking uh, in behalf of, of our students who were able who can now speak or do have conversations in Tagalog by starting to learn the Tagalog sentence patterns and. Uh, Ate Roda would always tell our, our students, just remember the patterns, learn the patterns, and then you'll be able to formulate your sentences. And then that would that would help you in in uh, learning how to speak the language. So my suggestion is if you want to go on the technical side, maybe you start learning the sentence patterns first, like the NASA sentence, the sa the uh, my sentence, adjective sentence, verbal sentences. And I also learned those from Ate Roda herself because I didn't know those things when I was in the Philippines because it's different when you just only know how to speak Tagalog, uh, unlike when you know the, the rationale behind the, the language system of Tagalog. 
that would help learning the Tagalog patterns. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ate. <laughs> Do, do, would you want to say something about the difference between Filipino and Tagalog? Uh, again, there is a longer discussion yes, of, of that topic uh, in our website. But coming from the Philippines, you know how, yes, you know how how is that differentiated in the Philippines? And then I could what? probably say something about how we differentiate that here in in the U.S. Uh, what I know about Filipino is like. Philippine, the, the national language, one of the official languages of the Philippines is the Tagalog based Filipino. But mm -hmm. what I know is that Filipino represents the other Philippine languages that is that are spoken in the Philippines, like to be politically correct, like, this is Filipino and Philippi under Filipino, there are other Philippine languages that that go with it because it's, uh, it's I could say it's not pure anymore, the Tagalog or the Filipino language. It's a combination of different languages already, like influence of Spanish, of English, and other Philippine languages like Bisaya and Kapampangan. So I think that's that's how Filipino is different with Tagalog. Mm -hmm. I hope I made sense. <laughs> See, so we um looks like yeah we are running out of time, um, so I think we'll start to wrap it up. Um, but uh, we'll have our emails uh, available um, as you'll see here shortly in in the close of tonight's program, and uh, you can email us directly if you have any if you have any questions. I know there's a question about whether again somebody had asked they might have missed my answer, but whether we would have this available as a recording for later. And I'm afraid we don't know the answer to that. We're still getting used to this webinar platform and we don't know whether we can download it or not. So um, so you'll have to bear with us. But if, if we do make it available, um, you'll be notified. Mm -hmm. um, and so with that, I just want to thank Rodolin and John Paul again and and Rose Tobayan for, for really um, mm -hmm. putting all this together for us along with Lani Chan and Ruben Salazar, and for all our co-curators who's who've been partners with us for uh, many years, and uh, thank you for joining us, everyone. Thanks for joining. We hope you had as much fun as we did in preparing and presenting this webinar. I am Lani Chan, a member of the Philippine American Co-Curation Group, as well as a volunteer in the Anthropology Collections Department at the Field Museum. Similar to hobby or weaving, and as speakers aptly presented, we saw in the Filipino languages some fascinating relationships woven and spoken in terms of the Bayanihan or community spirit. This reflects a unique feature of the Filipino culture. Should you have any inquiries, please don't hesitate to contact us. Good evening or good day to everybody. I'm Ruben Salazar, a first-generation Filipino-American community leader, organizer, volunteer in the greater Chicago area. In closing, I would like to thank our amazing speakers for tonight's presentation. First, Mr. Jamie Kelly, the head of Anthropology Collections at the Field Museum. Mr. John Paul De La Rosa, Fulbright Foreign Language Teaching Assistant at Northern Illinois University. And last but not the least, Ms. Rodalyn Gallo Crail, an instructor of Tagalog at the Northern Illinois University. I also would like to thank two other members of our team, Ms. Lani Chan, a volunteer in the Anthropology Collections Department at the Field Museum, and of course, Ms. Rose Tibayan, a Field Museum co-curator and co-founder of the Sampaguita Scholarship Group. The true Bayanihan community spirit, the six of us got together, planned and coordinated this presentation in the Philippine languages with collection highlights from the Field Museum. On behalf of all of us on the team and the organizations that we represent, we thank you for attending 
uh, and offer all of our sincerest thanks for attending. We hope that you learned something new about the Filipino language and culture and enjoyed viewing some Philippine items stored in the vaults of Film Museum. Maraming salamat and thank you very much. Magandang gabi. Ako si Chris Bechtel at Tagalog ang hinila kahin kong salita. Sa panahon ng pangaba at kalituhan, tandaan natin na tayo ay isang komunidad, isang bansa at isang digdig. Magsama-sama tayo at magtuglungan. Marahay na banggi. Ako tabi si Maria Grace D. De La Cruz. Bicol ang nakadakoan ko na tataramon. Sa panahon na irug sa di na makahadlok ng warang kasiguraduhan, Tandaan natun na sarok lang kita na komunidad. Sarok na banwa, sarok na kinabaan. Magkaurupod kita ng magtarabangan. Naimbag nga aldaw, Kenka, Shak, ni Eris P. Eugenio, Ken Ilocano ti kinadakkelak nga panagsasarita o panagsasao. Iti panawen, ti panagdanag, Ken riribo, panunutin tayo, masitayo kit, may may sanga komunidad, may may sanga pagilian, ken may may sa nga lubong. Agkakadwa tayo, ken agtitinulong tapno makabangon. Masanto si Labi at si Kayun Amin, siyak si Jover Tucci. Mansalita ang natin at si kayo at salita yung pangasinan. At sayang pa na o niya ang gapoy kasiguro doon, tandaan nyo namin niya sa sakita yung komunidad, sa sakita yung nasyon, sa sakita yung mundo. Laban tayo yan. Fighting! Ayan pa ba yung ipo? Ayad-ayad ng gabi. Ako si Raymond Lara, kakiligay nun ang akon na mataan ng lingwan. Sa tiyon sang kakulba, kagwala sang kasiguraduhan, aton gid tandaan nga kita isa lang kakomunidad, isa lang kanasyon, kag isa lang kakalibutan. Ililimaw kita kag magbinuligay. Mabay nga gabi ha iyong atanan. Ako hi Judel Pinirenda. Nayakan ako ha waray-waray. Si Buwano ang akong sinurkihan. Niining panahon nga walay kasiguradukan, hinumduming akita usa ka komunidad, usa ka nasod, o usa ka kalibutan. Diin kitang tanan dinhi magkauban o magbinuligay. Dagang salamat.